Welcome to the uh, 19th annual faculty lecture. As you know, the um, previous lectures constitute a, a luminous roster of the most distinguished, uh, among the most distinguished professors of this university. Uh, four Nobel laureates, three of whom we captured before they became Nobel laureates. And uh, this, however, is the first time, only the second time, that we've had a performing artist, or more precisely, artist. And I'm sure that helps explain the size of this audience. Uh, she needs no introduction, really, but I'll give her one anyway. Uh, Besides what you read in the announcement and in the press and what you know on your own, uh, Robin McCabe enjoys an enviable reputation. She was an undergraduate at the University of Washington and she graduated summa cum laude, which means she took courses outside of the School of Music. Uh, <laughs> and she must have been sort of smart. <laughs> she earned her MA and PhD at the Juilliard School. Her dissertation was on Franz Liszt, his maturation as a composer through revisions. I can't tell you what pleasure I took in reading that uh, dissertation title. I am a reviser. I will not become Franz Liszt, but uh, she spent a lot of time in New York, struggling, working, performing with orchestras around the world, performing in solo recitals. Uh, and in 1987, she came back to the University of Washington and continued to do all those other things. Uh, that she had done there, but she joined our faculty in 1987 uh, from the Juilliard School where she had been working uh, subsequent to her degrees there. She is, of course, a multiple talent, having performed with orchestras around the world, including on several occasions the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. But Europe the U.S., Canada, South America, Asia, all of these venues have been the beneficiaries of her extraordinary talent. She is a teacher in great demand in the School of Music. A wonderful personality and I am sure a gifted uh, teacher. But most strange of all, she has become an administrator in the last year, she has become the director of the School of Music. Um, now, sitting where I sit, there are only two academic units that rival each other in fractiousness and ungovernability. Uh, one is uh, the School of Law, and the other is the School of Music. <laughs> and that Robin McCabe, with all of her gifts and all of her other achievements, has become the director of the School of Music is truly wonderful and a, from my standpoint anyway, considerable uh, uh, accolade. Each year before this dinner, uh, before this uh, lecture, we have a dinner in our home um, to honor all of the past recipients and the current recipients of this award. And, and I trust everyone understands that this is an award not uh, handed out by administrators or other ephemera. This is an award uh, granted by a faculty committee and designed to, to honor and respect the central core of the institution. And each year, as I say, Ruth and I have had a dinner for these people. Um, 
and I am here to report that Robin McCabe is a stimulating dinner companion, but not tonight. Uh, I have been at dinners at other places with her, but tonight uh, she abjured and said that she would come by and say hello, which she did, but she was preparing herself for this uh, evening, which is appropriate for an artist. And we are the beneficiaries of all of that. And it is my great honor to introduce Robin, who will speak on, and I trust perform, on the topic, Remembrance of Things Played, Performance and Reflections of the Pianist's Art. Robin McCabe. Thank you, Dr. Gerberding, for your very, very generous remarks. And thank all of you for favoring me here tonight with your presence. This honor, apart from the personal gratification it brings me, also brings immense satisfaction that a signal has been sent in recognizing music and indeed the performing arts. This cause is a torch I carry each day of my life because I know that the arts speak to what unites us all under one skin. Now I have to confess to you that the dynamics of this occasion presented me with a bit of a dilemma. Tonight, am I a concert pianist presenting to you a concert with comments, or am I a university professor giving you a lecture with musical examples? What to do? As I pondered this opportunity, I found myself at dinner with our president uh, several weeks ago, and we were chatting about various things, including the opportunity of this evening, and I was waxing pretty eloquent about my ideas for tonight, some wonderful explorations of form, analysis, and idioms, and all of a sudden, just a slight twinge of apprehension traversed that patrician brow of his, and he looked at me and he said, now Robin, you are going to play, aren't you? <laughs> well, that was a fairly clear signal. <laughs> My colleagues at the School of Music in the last couple of weeks have been giving me encouraging remarks and asking how my lecture is going. And when I would complain to them that one of the difficulties was actually selecting the repertoire, they'd look at me incredulous and say, my gosh, you don't mean you have to play too? So in the end, my choice is obvious, the best that I can muster from both worlds. Tonight, I propose to bring to you some of the music which is currently close to me, music which represents significant milestones in the development of the piano and modern pianism. Beyond that, I hope to explore with you the role of the performer as interpreter, as the trafficker between the composer and the listener. I suppose it could be said that I live in a rather insular world. While some of you are pushing the frontiers of immunology, finessing the microchip, I'm sitting at the piano, contemplating a dollop of pedal in Debussy, or the tension and release in a phrase of Beethoven. I have spent thousands of hours looking at tiny black dots on a printed page, <laughs> trying to bring some cohesion and unity into those dots that will translate into something meaningful and memorable for the listener. My research deals with how to interpret a language. Some of my interpretive discoveries come as a result of years of study, of playing a piece of music, of performing it, of teaching it, of looking at it. Other realizations present quickly, magical, like summer lightning. As music is a means of communication, music is a language of sorts, and it may, a language that is transcribed in a code that actually needs to be interpreted. The artist whom we think of as a great interpreter 
is that one who best interprets the code and reveals subtleties that a less perceptive reading has failed to observe. The richer the performer's imagination, the greater his command, the deeper his intuition, the more humane his culture, the more he will fulfill the potentialities of the music he performs. Now, even more interesting for me, intriguing, is that what makes performance truly interesting and more than just entertainment is that each listener brings to a performance memories of other performances, a history of relationships with music, a web of affiliation, association, and all this is activated by the particular performance at hand. In this way, performance taps into the audience's subjective time, enriches it, and makes it more complex. Every good performer will activate this memory bank in a different way. The recital is very much an essay in its best idealization. The recital, like the essay, is occasional, recreative, and personal. Ideally, the pianist in playing a piece offers a commentary on the music, a refraction, if you will, just as a good essay will comment on a great novel. It is time to begin the essay, and the piano is here. In my life, I guess I've played thousands of pianos in the world. Steinways, Bechsteins, Bösendorfers, Rippons, Schimmels, Young Changs, Kawais, Yamahas, Chickering, Mason and Hamlin, Petrovs, and even Soviet pianos with the name of what else but Red October. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, it is a lamentable reality of the pianist's lot that there are a few good pianos out there, but there are many, many more PSOs, piano-shaped objects. <laughs> now, when we encounter one of these recalcitrant creatures, we know we're in for a long night. Uh, but happily tonight, we have a real piano and a very nice piano, so I can't complain on that issue. 1685 was a grand year for music. A sensational troika came into the world. Johann Sebastian Bach, Handel, and the Neapolitan I now turn to, Domenico Scarlatti. The son of a famous opera composer, Scarlatti was surrounded by music from earliest age. But the major contribution he was to make to music lay far ahead in his future. It is a marvelous example of necessity kindling genius. At age 53, in the year 1738, Scarlatti was in service to the Queen of, of Spain, Maria Barbara. The Queen desired to improve her harpsichord technique, so she requested, as a court composer, Scarlatti oblige and write some music for her. He did so dutifully and entitled these modestly 30 exercises. And they have the following remarkable dedication, which I'd like to share with you. Dear reader, whether you be dilettante or professor, in these compositions, do not expect any profound learning, but rather an ingenious jesting with art. This should accommodate you to the mastery of the harpsichord, not visions of ambition, but only obedience moved me to publish them. Therefore, show yourself more human than critical, and your pleasure will increase. Live happily. Now, Scarlatti did not have a vision, judging by these self-effacing words, that he would eventually produce a set of more than 550 small pieces that present a range of originality and emotional scope unsurpassed by any keyboard composer of his century. In their most virtuosic format, these pieces are imbued with sp Spanish motifs, street cries, bold harmonies, and witty rhythmic shifts. And it is here, in these small pieces, that the seedling of future sonata form is sown. Because Scarlatti found ingenious new ways of contrasting themes and moods. This was not present in the dance movements of the Baroque era. So I've chosen two sonatas for you. The first is a bold Spanish jota. And the second is a perfect example of Scarlatti that is most vibrant and virtuosic.
In the last quarter of the 18th century, the piano moved out of the court, the salon, and into the public concert hall. And because a young bohemian pianist, Jan Dusek, fancied himself so handsome, he thought to turn his right side to the public. Now this accomplished two things. Dusek was able to show off his noble brow, and the raised lid of the piano could now act as a sounding board, pushing sound and tone out into the auditorium. The public, having been accustomed to seeing only the backs of pianists, usually in salons, was enthralled. And pianists have been showing off their profiles ever since. <laughs> the 19th century was made for the piano, at least the piano as we now know it. And one composer particularly personified the piano, dedicated his work almost exclusively. The piano is my second self, he said. Frédéric Chopin. He was five and a half feet tall, weighed 110 pounds, and looked quite not of this world, transparent, fragile. George Sand later called him her little one, and Mendelssohn, no heavyweight himself, dubbed him Chopinetto. <laughs> Chopin did not like the large concert hall. He played very few concerts in big halls. He said, I was not made to give concerts. The audience makes me shy. I feel suffocated by their breath, paralyzed by their curious stares. Now, this was not stage fright on his part. It's just that his incredible sensibilities were not the kind that would be enthusiastic about communal excitement. But Chopin had exquisite sensitivity and an ability to sense the potential in pianistic sounds, textures, and techniques. Now, President Gerberding told me at that same dinner where we shared many witty encounters that he was very interested in me answering a question tonight. He maintains that he can always tell when he hears Chopin that it's Chopin, and he wants to know why. This is actually a great question, and one could spend a lot of time on it. The first thing that comes to mind is Chopin's particular affinity for the bel canto, the singing line. He loved Bellini, and I think in many ways tried to emulate that quality. Chopin's melodies have the effortless quality of an elegant aria hanging in the air. It's not so much that he wrote superior and more pretty tunes, but that they seem to lie so irrevocably and go forward so irrevocably. There's also Chopin's special treatment of chromaticism, a kind of enriched harmony, and his preoccupation with cello-like bass tones. But the more interesting key lies in another area. Listen to this very short phrase. It could only have been composed by Chopin. is a perfect example of Chopin's intuitive use of the overtone series in the bass line, and you will hear that intuitive use again and again in his piano works. Briefly, not to get too technical, but all musical instruments com produce composite sounds that result from the simultaneous sounding of many pure sounds. The lowest of these is called the fundamental, and that is the sound you hear when I strike a particular pitch. But in addition to this fundamental, there are a series of tones, there's a series of tones you don't hear. And they are very important, these tones, because they account for the different colors when the same pitch is sounded on different instruments, a violin, for instance, or an oboe. This is called the overtone series, and remember, it's one of diminishing intensity. Each tone, as it leaves the fundamental, gets weaker. Now, remember that little pattern, and let me show you, based on D-flat, what the real overtone series is. 
starting with D flat. That Chopin uses in that nocturne. Now, the point, what's the point of all this, since it was intuitive and it was genius? What happens because of this predilection he had? The bass is never heavy because thickness is always away from that lowest tone. Chopin's basses are always radiating clarity and balance, and they are the perfect sonority to accompany the singing flexible line of the right hand. The nocturne style of Chopin demonstrates this very admirably, so I turn now to the F-sharp major nocturne, opus 15.
1929, the waltzes of Johann Strauss Sr. and Josef Lahner were all the rage. This popular waltz style has evolved from a kind of rough Austrian jump dance, if you will, where men in heavy mountain boots stamped their feet and occasionally threw their women over their shoulders. Now, as the dance evolved, it lost some of its coarseness, but Chopin was thoroughly appalled by the commonality of this sort of thing, as well as the fact that no one, as he wrote in a letter, was interested in listening or writing any other kind of music. There is a theory that he wrote his G-flat waltz, the exact date is uncertain, as a brilliant but sarcastic parody of the Viennese waltz style, along with some real fun making of the falsetto yodeling of Austrian peasants. Just for fun, here's a few bars and you can be the judge. You have to have good peripherals for that piece with all this going on. <laughs> Chopin did go on to write beautiful and elegant waltzes. They are so masterful in their moods and episodes that they cannot be considered waltzes for dancing. Rather, as Schumann said, they are waltzes of the mind. Here is the grand waltz, opus 18 in E flat major.
Stravinsky called Maurice Ravel the Swiss clockmaker because of his extraordinary craftsmanship. There is not an impulsive quality to Ravel's music. Instead, one finds precision, invention, imagination, and sensuous refinement. His musical language sought above all clarity and luminosity of intent. Ravel sometimes was seen as a cold and aloof person. He wore much of his emotions beneath his customary elegant velvet vest. But in truth, he was a very passionate man about many things outside of music, gardening, cooking, collecting, uh, many, many things. Ravel's tone poem, Ondine, is the first of three pieces in the great cycle Gaspard de la Nuit. Ondine is a beautiful evocation of the captivating mirage of water and its mysterious movements. The poetry of the Gaspar is by Bertrand, a poet known for his refined and sensitive use of sonorities in the language. Just to give you a bit of the poem's context, the beginning in this music brings forth the melody of Andine and the magic spell of the night. She describes in undulant song her underwater palace. As the music continues, the melody becomes more sensual and depicts Andine's attempts to seduce and lure a man to come and join her beneath the sea as the, her king. As the music grows in persuasive power and depth, the man finally confesses that he loves and is promised to an ordinary mortal. Well, Andine is enraged, she's vexed and spiteful. She bursts into bitter laughter and vanishes again below the sea in a streaming wash of white.
The performing virtuoso dominated the 19th century. I think it was made for him. The Romantic period was one of daring, of individual will, expressivity, and of enormous receptivity to the external world. Poets, painters, sculptors, and musicians fixated upon nightingales, violets, lilies, plants, and animals. And men were taunting the forces around them, fumbling with steam engines, hot air balloons, and portentous little flashes of electricity. There was tremendous interest in the mystical and in the supernatural. Enter the era's fatal man of music, Paganini. With his incredible violin technique and his cadaverous and threatening physique, Paganini was instantly declared the devil himself, or at least a close relation. Paganini's namesake in the piano literature was Franz Liszt. Liszt was the absolute incarnation of the modern piano. Born in a lucky year, 1811, the year of a great comet, Liszt went on to personify the artistic ideal of the age, the romantic hero conquering the multitudes with his musical prowess and personal charisma. Being an ardent Listian myself, I have to say that there is much to be appreciated and recognized beyond his virtuosity. The fame of Liszt, the pianist, in a way has eclipsed us of an adequate appreciation of Liszt, the composer. It's not largely known that in 1847, at the height of his fame and fortune, he vanished from the concert stage and he never again appeared in public as a paid artist. While in his 30s, this could not have been a casual decision to abandon a lucrative concert career, but he was determined to compose and he did so indefatigably for the rest of his life, producing over 1,300 works in almost every genre. What I've chosen for you tonight is his concert paraphrase on Verdi's opera, Rigoletto. Now, Liszt wrote many operatic transcriptions, and they provided him a new arena for him to exploit his technical arsenals, but they also provided him an opportunity to champion the works of colleagues whom he liked, his peers. So you will find him transcribing Schubert, Chopin, uh, Wagner, many, many different composers in many guises. Now this particular paraphrase is an elaborate version of the famous quartet from the opera. It's intimate, conversational, and yet very narrative, and I hope you will hear the various emotions depicted of the characters, the romantic zeal, flirtation, jealousy, and even bleak despair.
tonight, in closing, I turn again to the title of this presentation, Remembrance of Things Played. Music and musical performance have an enduring place in the memory of the listener, the appreciator. Perhaps that is its greatest value, that something is retained, distilled, and made personal to each listener who takes it out of the concert hall to wherever he then goes. Wallace Stevens, in his poem, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, muses upon those virtues of the bird singing, which he most admires, and he talks about noble accents and lucid, inescapable rhythms, all which attract him. He can't decide what he likes best. Here is the verse which has struck me. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is it possible that it is the just after which is important and ineffable in great performance? It is the possibly just after, the reflexive listening experience which remains with us. Is the just after the human gift of memory and recollection which is one's own participation in the listening? And if so, is it possible that this recollection can become a taproot from which the listener can draw in days to come. I thank you for your listening, for sharing this exploration with me, and I hope that some of this music making has lodged in a way with you in your memory and that you will carry this remembrance now past into the future. Thank you.